Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you all to the very first session of the seventh annual HAP Summer Lecture Series. Um, and first, I, I want to say thank you. We've had a lot of very generous sponsors that have um, that have contributed to uh, us being able to present this session as well as the, the next two sessions. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to the American Parkinson's Disease Association who provided us with funding so that we would be able to videotape these two summer lectures series sessions. So thank you to them. Uh, also thank you to um, AbbVie, Impax, Medtronic, UCB, Acadia, Silverado, US World Meds, Home Instead, Lundbeck, Abbott, uh, Dr. Alfanoy, Belmont Village, Health South, and TTI Home Health. All of these um, entities have sponsored this session as well as the other two and have made it possible for us to present really quality programs um, at no charge. So we thank them. If we could give them a round of applause, that would be great. Yes. Okay, so now I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Yalto. If you want to make your way up. All right, so Dr. Yalto is a movement disorder specialist who practices at Methodist uh, Sugarland Neurology Associates and who came to H the Houston area from the Arizona Neurology Institute. He's a graduate of Ross University School of Medicine and he completed an internship in internal medicine, a residency in neurology, and a fellowship in neurophysiology, all at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. He then completed another fellowship in movement disorders at the University of Texas Medical School in Houston, followed by a second year at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Dr. Yalto is board certified in neurology and sleep medicine. He specializes in helping patients with movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease, tremor, restless leg syndrome, and other medical conditions, and is a current member of the HAPS Medical Advisory Board. Today, he is going to be addressing sleep issues in Parkinson's disease, so please welcome Dr. Yalto. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so that was a lot of fellowships I did, and uh, I did, uh, I think, after neurology residency, I did another three years of fellowship, so I did a year of neurophysiology. Came up to, uh, we were in San Antonio at the time, and uh, came up to Houston and did a uh, second year of fellowship doing movement disorders and Parkinson's disease, and I enjoyed it so much that I decided I'd go for a third year. And so, uh, so I moved across the street from UT Houston to Baylor, did my, that, that year there, uh, and then after that, my wife told me to go get a job, so then we started to move out, so. I actually almost didn't make it here today. I actually was, we usually have our talks at the American Red Cross Center uh, of 59, and uh, so this morning, I don't have clinic. I work out at Methodist in Sugarland, and I, I, my kids are in, and they're taking a math camp, my nine and seven year old. So I dropped them off at math camp in Sugarland, and that was at 8.45, and I was outside, got a cup of coffee. I was sitting outside across the street from the American Red Cross Center, the wrong building until about 9.50 when I walked in and I said, hey, uh, and she kind of looked at me and there weren't that many cars there and I was a little surprised. And uh, so I made it here in 10 minutes. So um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for HAPS, Kathleen, everybody asking me to speak. I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about Parkinson's disease and sleep disorders. Both of those are uh, two of my big interests. And let's go on. So, so we're gonna talk about uh, sleep stages to start off with. So just a little background. So when you go to sleep, you have to remember that you actually don't just go from awake to sleep, right? So you go through different stages of sleep. And the way I like to think about it is, think of it as getting into an elevator and taking it down one below, one below, and keep on going. So you tend to start with wakefulness and then you go into stage one, stage two, stage three sleep. And, and it's a cycle that occurs every 90 minutes. So actually you start here and you go down into stage one and then you go into stage two and stage three and then eventually at the bottom you get into REM sleep. That's a deep stage of sleep which we'll talk about a little bit more. And what happens is uh, over time, over 90 minute cycle, you kind of cycle back up through wakefulness and then go back down. And you do this throughout the night. And so it tends to be from the time you go to bed and fall asleep, 90 minutes before you reach that end of that first cycle. Okay. 
And this is kind of important because you think about it, you're cycling throughout the night. And so there are a lot of sleep apps now you can get on your phone that, uh, that can actually listen. And I've tried this where it actually listens to your body and kind of can tell by your breathing, muscle tone, just by the movement. And it can tell what stage of sleep that you're in. So you can kind of see where you are in stage of sleep. And what they've actually done is they've developed these apps that they actually have timers now that they can actually wake you up when you're in a light stage of sleep, right? Where you're easily woken up versus where if somebody wakes you up in a deep stage of sleep, and everybody's had this happen to you early in the morning, somebody wakes you up and you just can't get up because you're groggy. So remember, that's in the deep stage of sleep. So now with these apps kind of waking you up uh, earlier, that actually helps you get out of bed. And one of the problems is uh, when you're an infant or a child, you go directly into these deeper stages of sleep, right? So babies sleep most of the time, right? And then as you age over time, what happens? you don't get that restful sleep. You're kind of hanging out in that stage one and stage two, which leads to people being fatigued, tired, saying, hey, I slept for that same amount, eight hours, but what happens? I'm still tired, right? So, so this happens throughout the night, and I want you to kind of remember that as far as cycling throughout the 90 minutes. So uh, this one says, uh, so no, I have not slept well. Why do you ask? And everybody has this feeling. Sometimes, right? So it, sometimes it happens more often than you'd think or more often than you'd wish. But you, you tend to have these uh, days where you just don't sleep well for whatever reason. And so why don't you sleep? And we're going to talk about these different things. i use this little pointer here. So uh, we're going to go through these different reasons for not sleeping. Insomnia, something called nocturnal off, restless leg syndrome, leg cramps, REM behavior disorder, sleep apnea, urinary problems, depression, anxiety, something called akathisia, daytime sleepiness, uh, medication effect, or poor sleep hygiene. And we'll go through those individually. So going to sleep, insomnia, right? So what do they say? Count sheep, right? So this gentleman is counting. He's at 1,896,254. And you just keep counting, right? But you can't get to sleep for whatever reason. Everybody has these different types of sleep tricks that we have to help us fall asleep. Insomnia, what is that? Okay, of course, everybody knows about insomnia. It's difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep. And that's an important distinction. Okay? Difficulty initiating sleep. So sleep onset insomnia. You may go to bed, turn off the lights, you lie down, what happens? You don't fall asleep for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. Sleep onset insomnia. Versus something called sleep maintenance insomnia, where you wake up and then you can't go back to sleep. Right? So those are two different distinctions. And those are important because uh, when you look at things like medications for insomnia, okay, if you have sleep onset insomnia, I can't fall asleep, but I can stay asleep. So when you think about the type of medication you want, you want something that may only last a couple hours, right? It's out, out of your system. It has a short half-life, meaning that the drug or the medication sticks around for a short period of time. It doesn't cause that hangover effect in the morning, right? Versus sleep maintenance insomnia, where you fall asleep, Fine, but then when you wake up, you have problems and you can't go back to sleep. So you may need a medication that lasts longer. So something that may last five to six hours that may end up having the problem of causing a bit of drowsiness in the morning. Okay, so think about that when you're talking about insomnia. It's not just insomnia due to uh, one thing or the other. So this actually increases the risk of accidents, mood disorders, and substance abuse. And uh, I did a talk for a high school uh, recently on sleep disorders. And we were looking at, looking at the data as far as what it was. Insomnia causes problems with sleep, which causes you to be, what, tired during the day, right? So they have looked at uh, students, high school students, and said, okay, well, high school students, some of them start class at 7.30 in the morning. And they think that's actually too early, okay? Too early for kids. And so what does that lead to? It leads to them having, what, poor ability to do those tasks, uh, do poor performance in school, accidents mood disorders, substance abuse, because you're tired all the time. So there are some places in the country that have instituted where you should actually only have class that starts at 8.30. I wish that was where I was at school, right? Or class that starts at 9 o'clock. Because if you think of uh, different, uh, different areas of sleep or different ages of sleep, uh, when you're younger and teenage year, you tend to stay up later, right? And you, have, uh, you wake up later. So you have this delayed sleep phase syndrome. So everybody says, how many hours of sleep do you need? Well, they say eight hours, but everybody has kind of an internal clock, right? It tells you how long you need to sleep. I wish I was somebody who could only sleep four hours, right? There's so many things that you could wake up and do early in the morning. But everybody needs different hour amount. 
So if it's a, a high school student who goes to bed late, wakes up late, right, versus when you get older, you like to go to bed early. Maybe you go to bed at 8 o'clock, but you wake up at 5 o'clock. So that's an advanced sleep phase syndrome. So you've moved your, moved your actual time of sleep earlier. You've advanced it versus delay. Make sense? 30% uh, of adults have insomnia. And you see that actually 50% in people who are over 65. And what do you see with Parkinson's? Up to 98%. Right? And I have a lot of Parkinson's patients and, and we talk about this a lot. This is where it's good for me because I have that interest in sleep too. So we kind of work on their sleep disorder or insomnia. Um, it gets worse as disease progresses. Okay? And uh, most commonly you see sleep fragmentation. So you get fragmented sleep. What does that mean? You wake up two, three times a night. And remember, people say, okay, well, I woke up two, three times a night, but I went back to sleep fine. But, but your sleep is disturbed. Your, your stages of sleep are off. So that's going to cause you to be fatigued during the day. It may cause things like accidents if you're driving. It may cause you to doze off if you're not doing anything. So these things are all important. You know, some people, uh, I see people who come in with insomnia every once in a while. And, and there was a lady who came in not too long ago and she said, you know, doctor, I just can't sleep. I can't sleep no matter what I do. And I say, okay, well, let's talk about it. And she goes, okay. Well, what do you do before you go to bed? Well, I usually do my work in bed. So I have my laptop. It's like, oh, okay. And my husband's watching TV and, you know, the light's on. And, you know, I, I tend to do, and she started telling me, she goes, I tend to do all my work in bed. And I said, okay, well, what do you mean? She goes, uh, well, you have insomnia. Okay, so you probably shouldn't do work in bed, right? So she goes, well, you know, I actually moved a refrigerator into my bedroom. <laughs> so she's got a refrigerator in her bedroom and she's got... Diet Coke in the refrigerator, you know. So all of these things are just horrible sleep hygiene, right? Like, I mean, before you even start talking about medications, you have to train your brain to think differently about this whole situation. So, so that was kind of the first thing. You can get these sleep diaries. You take two week uh, period of time, and you say, okay, well, let's see what you've been doing over two weeks. Let's monitor it. So I'm not going to ask you guys to memorize this, but this is just kind of to talk about uh, a little bit about the different types of medications that are involved. There are medications, um, and this is not a complete list, but definitely this is medications that are benzodiazepines. So you think of those medications that are like Valium, right, Xanax, Ativan. Um, and then there are some that are non-benzodiazepine, and there are some that are extended release and immediate release. Okay, so when you look at these different types of things, um, they work on different areas. So if it's a benzodiazepine that's short acting, it may be good for what? Sleep onset insomnia, right? So it's out of your system, doesn't stick around, versus something that's extended release. And so things, Zolpidem is one, you know, that everybody knows or has heard about is Ambien, right? Ambien's a good medication, causes some strange things. I've heard people tell me things like, you know, I wake up and I've, I don't know, I, something's wrong. I just feel like I'm gaining weight. It's like, Oh, okay, well, tell me about that. And you're like, and my fridge was open. Causes something called sleep eating. Very strange. Sleep eating, sleep sex. It does happen. They don't remember it. So anytime you take a medication for the first time, you want to take it while you're in bed, okay? Because you never know what the effect is. So it doesn't happen with everybody, but these are some strange side effects that sometimes we can see. So uh, they have different medications. Ambien has come in kind of a CR version now, so controlled release, right? So it lasts longer. It helps with sleep maintenance insomnia. And then they've developed medications that you wake up in the middle of the night, now you can take a medication. So they're looking at different ways of uh, treating insomnia. But of course, trying to change the, the brain or try and help with the, the thought process as far as going to bed. Because of course, that gets into your, your head. Oh, I can't sleep. I go to bed, I'm not going to sleep. So you definitely need to kind of alter that thinking. And they have things like cognitive behavioral therapy where you can go to a psychologist who can help to retrain the brain in a sense, okay? And so when this happens, you stop thinking because you get these thoughts. Of course, uh, these thoughts can keep you up when you're thinking, hey, I'm just not going to sleep. So with all the different names that they have, this, uh, this says, if the sleeping pills don't work, just chant their soothing brand name and you'll fall asleep. Right? So Ambien, Rosarum, Belsamra, all these names that sound just great, right? Like you take this medication, this is going to be the one that's going to help you go to sleep, right? But it doesn't always work that, out that way. So there are a variety of different things that we can use. Uh, when we talk about Parkinson's disease, when you're first diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, um, you tend to take medication two, three times a day, right? So what happens, the reason you take any medication two, three times a day, a lot of, a lot of it has to do with the half-life, how long it lasts in your system. Take a medication, it works, then it wears off, right? 
take it again, works, and wears off three times a day. And initially when you have Parkinson's disease, it's very consistent, right? So the dopamine receptors in the brain take up that dopamine in a very consistent manner. What happens is over time with Parkinson's is you get changes in a variety of things, including that dopamine receptor. So even though you give the same amount of medication, it's not being taken up by that receptor in the same manner. When that happens, you can have variations, right? You can have something that happens where you have no on, right? When we talk about Parkinson's and we talk about off and on, it often follows that dopamine up and down. So you have a tremor, you take your medication, it's on, right? Medication's working, dopamine level's high, tremor stops, then the medication wears off, and then what happens? You go to off again, right? So this is what happens throughout the day. Unfortunately, you know, it changes. And so it, it always happens as you advance with Parkinson's, it doesn't work as well. And you say, well, what's going on? This medication is just not working for me. But it's really actually a change on a biochemical basis that these medications aren't working. It isn't that the medication is becoming ineffective. It's just because, unfortunately, Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disorder Currently, we don't have a cure for Parkinson's, but it is a progressive disorder that causes loss of dopamine cells. And you tend to lose those dopamine cells over a period of time. And the thought is, even before you actually go see the doctor for the first time, you've already lost up to 50% of those dopamine cells. Okay, so we've looked at things and said, okay, well, you come in and that 50% happens, you develop a tremor, you go see the doctor because something's wrong. But before that, you may have had something else happen. So what happens throughout the night is you have these um, episodes. This could be something called a nocturnal off. Okay, remember we talked about the on-off. Everybody understands that. And when you get this nocturnal off, it's that the dopamine level wears off or lowers in the middle of the night. Remember, you take your medication. You may take it 8, 1, 6 o'clock, for example, every five hours. But between 6 p.m., you take your dose, and 8 a.m., it's a long time, right? You're talking 14 hours between dosing. So what happens is when you go to bed, then it goes off, and then you may develop these symptoms. So you may develop worsening symptoms that cause you to wake up. So now we look at things, and of course, talking to your doctor, timing of medication, what happens at certain points, we try and figure out how can we adjust medications to help you have the best on time with the least off time. Sometimes we'll take a controlled release medication at night before you go to bed, right. Cinemet, CR, uh, which some of you may be taking, you take it at night, it works throughout the night, helps you in the morning throughout the day. So this often happens with levodopa. Uh, you may have difficulty with tremor, rigidity, inability to turn in bed. So those are things that can happen when it goes off. And of course we talked about uh, treatment, dosing at bedtime, changing or adding a dose, maybe moving one dose later, going to four times a day, sometimes five times a day, it, it varies. And that's the challenging thing for Parkinson's is, you know, everybody's different, right? Everybody around you looks like they may be in a different phase or stage. Their medications are different. And then you hear these things. You say, oh, I've been on this medication or I know this person. And it doesn't exactly work like that for everybody. You know, there's new medications that are available. But everything is kind of tailored to your needs. And so that's why we encourage people to follow up with Parkinson's Movement Disorder Specialist. So we are doctors who have finished neurology. And now that neurology has become so subspecialized, Similar to you know going to an internist. You see your internist, you see a GI doctor, so now we've got epilepsy, neuromuscular, uh, headaches, cognitive, Parkinson's. So there's all these different things. And I probably shouldn't put it on like a level because Parkinson's is up here. And uh, when you say it like that, so it's, it's varying. And so it varies a lot as far as the skill that the doctor has. They may only have a handful of Parkinson's patients and say, okay, we'll try this, come back in six months. So definitely I encourage you to follow up with somebody who is a Parkinson's specialist so they can tailor those medications um, to your needs. And um, in the city of Houston, um, so it, there are a lot of movement disorder specialists that are here. We all kind of know each other. You actually end up knowing most of the ones around the country, uh, for instance. And so uh, uh, there's a lot of us here. Um, I think I'm still the only one that's outside the medical center, as far as I know, out in Sugar Land, but most of them are here. And I know most of them from Baylor, or UT, um, or Methodists. And so, I encourage you to find a movement disorder specialist that's near you and talk to them about things because, like I said, everybody's different. So we try and tailor things according to, to the individual patient. Restless leg syndrome. So this is another condition that's frequent and uh, common with, uh, with Parkinson's patients and just in general. 
you get what's called an urge to move your legs, okay? You get motor restlessness, and it's worse at rest and worse in the evening. So this is a little different than people who have just, you know, if you're sitting in your chair and, you know, you start moving or kicking or doing something like that. That's not quite restless legs. Um, that could be something else. So restless legs is typically this, where you get an urge uh, at, to move your legs. It's worse at night, worse when you're sitting, and it gets better with movement. Okay, there's actually a rating score that you can use for this to quantify it. But you gotta keep this in mind, this could be something else. So at night, if you're sleeping and you have something called periodic limb movements of sleep. So it could be that, and we're gonna show you about that a little bit uh, here. So people can have a family history of restless legs. You can see this with uh, neuropathy. You can see this with iron deficiency. So if you come in with restless leg syndrome, maybe you have iron deficiency and you take iron and it helps. B12 deficiency, all of these things can happen. We see this very commonly with Parkinson's. Sometimes it can happen before people develop Parkinson's disease. Uh, and treatment are medications uh, such as iron, changing dopamine, uh, levodopa or the dopamine agonist, uh, seizure medications, sometimes narcotics, sometimes morphine works, strange or Valium type medications. So again, it's this what we call an urge. So the cardinal features of restless legs is an urge to move the legs is usually associated with unpleasant sensation. So creepy crawlies, tingling, numbness, all these strange things that happen in your legs. You can have, and it's not just restless legs, you can actually have restless arm syndrome, right? Not as common, but it does occur. Um, rest makes it worse. It gets uh, better with movement, of course, and then it happens at evening or night. So this is a little different than uh, what's called periodic limb movements of sleep. So this is a sleep study. And uh, what I want you to just look at is, you know, what they do with a sleep study is they actually hook you up, they have some electrodes on your legs, and we can tell if the legs are moving. We're monitoring your breathing throughout the night, heart rate, respiratory status. And what, what this is, is this is uh, what's called an EMG. So they just put a little electrode and stick it on your legs. And what you can see is that every four to eight seconds, um, four to eight seconds, you see these episodes, this little kind of up and down. Everybody see those little things? So it happens every four to eight seconds. You start kicking, right? You kick your legs at night. It's periodic, every four to eight seconds, leg movements of sleep, okay? That's important uh, to keep in mind because it's usually not the patient who says, I have kicking and punching. It's usually the, the spouse who has been kicked, right? So this is something that can occur. This can be associated with other conditions like sleep apnea. Of course, this can be associated with some other uh, vitamin deficiency or nutrient deficiency. So looking at this is, uh, is something to keep in mind because that can occur. Nocturnal leg cramps. So this is where you get cramps in the legs, right? Uh, it's very common, can occur in your feet, and you say, oh, it just feels tight, I get tightness. This could be an off, a nocturnal off, a dopamine-related effect. Um, but you can see uh, cramps with different things, dehydration, potassium low, right? Electrolyte changes, uh, postures in, your, in the feet, uh, tight bedding can do it. Uh, we do things, uh, you know, with cramps, they say, Magnesium, hydration, prescription, uh, seizure medications. There's a variety of things. Uh, some people may hear of tonic, right? Tonic or pickle juice sometimes comes up. So, so they used to have quinine in this tonic, right? So it would be, and used to get this, and I think you can still get it at certain places where they give you quinine, either liquid or pill form that you take at night. And so, you know, and then you realize, okay, well, this is quinine is in tonic water. So hey, why don't you just have a gin and tonic before you go to bed? Right, so maybe that'll help. And so, so there's different things you can do. I'm sure tonic water by itself is good, but, uh, but there's other things I'm sure if you wanted to add, you could do. Okay, um, REM behavior disorder. So it's acting out dreams. We talked about different stages of sleep, right? So uh, stages of sleep, uh, you go to one, two, three, REM sleep, and you cycle. And so this is where people say they kick or punch or act out dreams, okay? So this isn't hallucinations at night. This is... You know, hey, I think somebody's fighting me or, you know, something's happening. And I've seen videos of bizarre things that people do in the middle of the night. Somebody waking up and choking his wife. <laughs> One of the most bizarre things. But just hitting, hitting the spouse is usually what happens. And this, again, is also noted usually by the spouse and not the patient, right? It doesn't bother the patient. They're fine. They're just having a vivid dream. So this can occur in Parkinson's. And so remember with Parkinson's disease, we talked about you lose... 50% of those cells before you develop these Parkinson's symptoms, before you develop tremor otherwise. So, so that's the big thing now is we're looking at non-motor or pre-motor 
uh, symptoms, right? We're trying to diagnose Parkinson's before you develop those symptoms. Because the thought is, you know, even though we don't have anything right now that can modify the clinical course of Parkinson's or slow the progression down, there are things that we can do if we can say, let's find it earlier. And so what we found is uh, REM behavior disorder is something that can occur with Parkinson's years before, right? We've looked at constipation, depression being one of the things that happens years before you develop Parkinson's disease. So now that if we can find that marker, and that's the big thing, find that biomarker, figure out what is it that may predate Parkinson's or tremor of Parkinson's or movement of Parkinson's, stiffness, slowness. And if we can find that, can we modify the disease at that point, increase the dopamine level, adjust it? And so this is something that happens. So REM behavior disorder, I remember doing uh, studies where we do spinal fluid or lumbar punctures and take off fluid in these patients and check the markers of people that only had REM sleep disorder. So they didn't develop Parkinson's disease. This can happen before Parkinson's happens. It doesn't mean if you have REM behavior disorder, you're going to become or develop Parkinson's symptoms, but it happens in up to 58% of people with sleep testing. So it's something that we can't see or people don't complain about when they're in the office. Um, you treat it if it's bothersome, okay? That's the only reason. And it's usually, again, like I said, it's not bothersome to the patient, right? <laughs> so you'll talk to the spouse and say, is this bothering you? Say, yeah, it's okay, you know, because you're adding medications. Of course, we try to minimize medications as much as we can, but sometimes we need to add medications. We use things like melatonin, which is over the counter. If you ever use melatonin, uh, I typically will recommend nine to 10 milligrams of melatonin, which is a little bit higher. Melatonin is something your body naturally produces. It helps with insomnia it helps with REM behavior disorder. If that doesn't work, medications such as clonazepam, which is 90% effective, right? Great medication that works, but of course, not something you wanna be on long-term. Uh, sometimes dopamine type medications uh, occur. And so uh, treat if bothersome, if there's a risk of injury, usually to the spouse, or if somebody kicks, punches, jumps there, or falls out of bed. Sleep apnea. Okay. So what happens with sleep apnea, and so these are just kind of going through individual different things that can affect your sleep. Sleep apnea, there's different things that can happen. You can have what's something called obstructive sleep apnea, so that's blockage of the airway. And what happens? You get snoring, right? And then you get these apneic events in the middle of the night, right? So somebody will say, oh, uh, my spouse is having these events. That could be blockage, so that's an obstructive, you're obstructing the airway. Or something called central sleep apnea, where there's something in the brain that's affecting your breathing. Okay, so there's different types, and you can pick this up on a sleep study. Um, when you try to breathe against a closed airway, that causes you to wake up, okay? And with central, you, you actually, the drive is not there. The brain, so it's central, it's coming from the brain. That drive to breathe isn't there. And so these things can affect your quality of life. Um, we talk about the different things as far as the airway. So the airway, this is a normal airway that mouth moves through. And then in this, you can see that there's blockage of the airway right here. Okay, when that gets blocked and the airway is obstructed, you have obstructive sleep apnea, which can cause you to wake up. Um, the risks of obstructive sleep apnea, of course, obesity, right? Bigger people, people have blockage of that airway when they sleep. Okay, large neck size. If you have a small airway, so I look in the back of your throat, see your tonsils, or you have a small airway. Males tend to have this more. Um, and with Parkinson's, you actually see it very commonly, okay? So something to think about. 20% of sleepy Parkinson's patients may have undergone a sleep study will actually have something like this. So when this happens, it can affect your quality of life because you're having these apneic events, right? So normal is to have less than five events an hour. So normal versus severe where you're having over 30 an hour, right? So you're having these episodes one every two seconds. So what happens? That's gonna cause sleep fragmentation which can cause sleep disruption, which can cause you to be sleepy during the day. So this is something that's not always diagnosed, not something that's always looked at, but should be uh, something to keep in mind. And usually the spouse may notice things, but one of the ways to test this is to do a sleep study. Of course, you can do home sleep studies where they, they do some things and monitor, or you can do an in-lab sleep study where you actually go into a sleep facility uh, in the evening and you are hooked up to all these machines and things and somebody watches you sleep. And uh, they try to recreate your environment kind of like a hotel room to see if we can actually determine what is causing the sleep problems. Uh, sleep apnea, if it's untreated, can cause a lot of problems. So it can cause poor memory, headaches, sweating, 
uh, sexual dysfunction, heart disease, and stroke. Okay, so there's a lot of things that can happen. Um, when we look at this treatment, of course, we talk of these different things. Everybody knows the machine and masks. Uh, there's surgical procedures. Weight loss can help a lot too. So this is the happiest person ever with the sleep apnea machine, right? <laughs> it just looks like so much fun. But this is actually probably what people think of when you talk about sleep apnea, right? As soon as you mention sleep apnea and machine, everybody kind of stops and you can almost see it in their face. So I don't want to use that mask. I don't want to do that, right? Because that's what they think of. So when we look at this um, type of therapy, what happens is the CPAP or the machine, what it does is it, it causes it's continuous. That's the C part of it. It gives a continuous pressure to open the airway. So it opens the airway and helps to uh, allow air to go through. So they have these other things that are now available. So this is something called ProVent and something very similar to this. Uh, these are uh, kind of nasal sticky things, not like those breathe rates that go over your nose, but these go right over. And uh, this can actually really help with uh, things as far as helping the airway. So you're breathing in, breathing out. And so this obstructs the airway in a certain way. And so it kind of blocks it. So you breathe in, everything goes fine. When you breathe out, it increases the pressure. So this may be an option if something doesn't work as far as kind of somebody uses a machine or mask. Of course, if you have sleep apnea, it depends on the severity of sleep apnea. If it's something that's very severe, then it may not be something that you can use. But if it's something that's mild, this may be an option. Okay. And this also says, uh, laugh and the world laughs with you. Snore and you sleep alone. <laughs> right? So nobody likes people who are snoring and disrupting the sleep. So they talk about this severe snoring that the bed partner has to go sleep in a different room. Right? And these masks, they used to be these really big masks and machines that people would have to carry around a big suitcase if they traveled. Now they've actually gotten a lot smaller. And so these things are, the, the masks are more comfortable. They can monitor different things. And so it's actually something that if you look at where sleep was years ago versus where sleep is now, there's been a lot of big strides. Um, urinary problems. So, this is something else that can occur. It's uh, pretty frequent. And so you have to think about these different things that are causing you to wake up in the middle of the night or disrupting your sleep. Okay, we've talked about a few different things. Um, I, I kind of, I always thought it was funny. I, when I was, I grew up in Canada, so I'm Canadian. Uh, I grew up in Canada, uh, came down and got uh, married to a girl from San Antonio, went to Houston and was in practice in Arizona because when you're from Canada, I came down on a visa, okay? so. I'm on a, a visa that says I either have to go back to Canada for two years or go work in a medically underserved area for three years. And so I thought, okay. So we're looking around for medically underserved areas in, in Texas, and a lot of them were kind of on the border, you know, which is okay. And uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, middle of nowhere. And so then we saw Phoenix, Arizona. We thought, wow, Phoenix, that's uh, just a remarkable place. And so, so we end up living about 20 minutes outside of uh, Scottsdale, which is which is pretty good for a medically underserved area. And so I, I was out in practice there for four years. And, uh, and we realized, you know, it's very kind of different here. Where I grew up in Canada, uh, from Alberta, which is Edmonton, so it's very similar to Texas. You know, cowboys, cattle, oil, same thing. So the economy works the same way here and there. And then versus Arizona, which is a wonderful place to visit, and I loved being there. But, but when you kind of look around at the scenery in Arizona, it's a little bit different than the scenery here, right? So, so they said, do you want grass in your yard? And I said, is that, you know, that's not really a normal question. I always think, yeah, you want grass in your yard. They say, well, people don't put grass in the front anymore. And so they do what's called zeroscaping. Zeroscaping, okay. So take some rocks and you kind of move them around a little bit. So it was always uh, interesting out there. Um, but I always think when I grew up in Canada, as far as things that were happening in Canada, I actually was in a we have basements, right? So we had one in Arizona. But when we were in Canada, we have a basement and my grandparents who lived with us at the time slept above me, right? And so I used to be sleeping. I remember hearing my grandfather talking in the middle of the night and thinking, oh, strange, why is he awake, right? And after a while, I realized uh, my grandmother was talking too. And I was like, why are they both awake? And I talked to them the next day and they, they said, you know, uh, we weren't awake. And so now when I kind of go back, I think, okay, well, now I know so much about sleep. I'm, I realize that my grandfather probably had REM behavior disorder 
And then over time, my grandmother actually developed it too. <laughs> so while I thought they were having a conversation, they both maybe just had REM behavior disorder at some point, and those conversations that neither of them remembered was, was actually a REM behavior disorder. So point being, there's different things that can wake you up in the middle of the night, right? So there's different things that can occur. Urinary problems. Uh, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you say, oh, I have to go to the bathroom two, three, four times at night. But why do you wake up? You don't usually wake up because you have to urinate. You wake up because something else has woken you up, right? So maybe you have undiagnosed, untreated sleep apnea that causes you to wake up, REM behavior disorder, some other things. And then when you're awake, what's a natural thing? You think, oh, well, I should go to the bathroom, right? So which is the problem? Is it something that's undiagnosed as far as as uh, causing you to wake up and something that would be fixed by a sleep study or testing for. So waking up, so you definitely want to avoid drinking fluids after seven o'clock, big, lots of water will cause you to wake up. So you see this where you get a dribbling hesitancy. So you have this obstruction, okay? So, in, and men generally have to have, the, or tend to get this because of prostate hypertrophy, right? And you get uh, nocturia, 50 to 60%. Parkinson's medications can do it, blood pressure changes can do it, and uh, these urinary problems get worse with disease progression, which is always challenging when you're a Parkinson's specialist because uh, you may go see the urologist and they say, well, this is due to your Parkinson's disease, go see the neurologist, and the urologist who takes care of that, you know, tries some medications, but there's only so many medications that we can use as neurologists that it becomes kind of something you said, the urologist said to see you for medications, and we're kind of looking at them going, I don't know what else to use at this point because there's some medications that we use. So trying to work well closely with the different specialists. And you guys have probably seen that with other specialists that you go see that they say, oh, well, this is probably due to your Parkinson's disease. But of course you want to rule out other conditions. You want to rule out other things that can cause nocturia, can cause obstruction. Uh, treatment, we use things, uh, these medications, oxybutynin, got to go type medication. Uh, these different things that you can use, bedside commode, Sometimes we use uh, catheters or condom catheters if these urinary problems can really affect quality of life. Uh, you wanna remove obstruction in men, generally that involves a prostate and catheterization and that sometimes has to be done. Depression anxiety. So there's some debate as far as how much this occurs in Parkinson's disease. Uh, I think the thought is that at least 50% of patients have some form of depression or anxiety. Okay. Of course, there are different things that can make you anxious, right? So there's not um, being able to do the things you wanted to do, of course, is one of the big things, right? Social embarrassments, people who work, who might have a tremor or stiffness or slowness, don't want their boss to see them or friends to see them. You may avoid social situations, may withdraw from those, right? So there's a lot of things that can occur. And so anxiety is very common. I think the number is actually probably higher than 50%. I think a lot of times, uh, in my clinic at least, I spend a lot of time addressing movement and Parkinson's, but then when we talk about other things, of course, we try and talk about anything that's affecting you that day. If it's constipation, sleep problems, then there's things like anxiety, depression, and we try to treat it as best as we can. But there's different things that, that can occur, and so, of course, we want to watch and make sure that we can help those. And so. Uh, people who accept that, understand that, family members who realize that and help with anxiety, usually responds well to antidepressant, although we try to avoid things uh, like stimulant type antidepressants or other medications. There's certain things that we can use, certain things that we don't, and the reason for that is a lot of the depression medications, uh, they work on the dopamine system, right? What's the problem there? <laughs> so we know Parkinson's is a dopamine problem. So now we're looking at medications that affect the serotonin syndrome, uh, work in different areas. So you want to adjust those medications according to things. Because of course, when you take these medications by increasing dopamine, it might be a good thing. But we also know sometimes uh, people develop dyskinesias, the wiggly movements, right? The, have you seen Michael J. Fox on TV? Uh, that was always interesting because that's a dopamine problem, right? He's actually taking medications. I remember way back when Rush Limbaugh who's the radio host uh, when Michael J. Fox was on TV at one point doing a commercial for some uh, politician in Florida. He said, oh, look at Michael J. Fox, he's faking it, right? Because he's wiggling, he's moving. For anybody who knows anything about Parkinson's disease, it's just such a terrible comment for somebody to say because we know that's not anybody faking or acting, that's actually Michael J. Fox in Parkinson's state, in the on situation, 
who has a lot of dyskinesias, right? He's an actor. He'd rather be moving a little bit too much, a little bit hyperkinetic versus being stiff and slow and bradykinetic, right? Slow versus stiff. So which state would you rather be? So he tends to over-medicate a little bit, may medicate a little bit more before he goes on TV or is in social situations. So these are different things to look at. So, so that's a dopamine issue. And so when we look at depression and anxiety, talking to your doctor and making sure the medication is appropriate for you. Akathisia. So you, some of you guys may be getting a little akathisia here. So this is uh, <laughs> an uncomfortable sensation in your body associated with restlessness, right? And you're sitting there and you just get this inner urge, you just got to move, right? Like you just, it's not quite restless legs. It's not happening at night or when you're sleeping. It's just you get this motor restlessness. This sometimes can occur with medications, but, but you get this at night. Um, you know, as a movement disorder specialist, one of the things, of course, a lot of what we do is visual, right? So we see things. So we see involuntary movements. And so, you know, seeing people just sitting and watching some movements, or if you're in an airport and you notice people with involuntary movements, I almost want to say, here's my card, you know, come see me or something. But this is something like an inner restlessness, right? Like people have a variety of different movements. Some people can have something called tics, you know, touching kids curling their hair, or people just, you know, doing something like that is something, you know, little, little types of movement. Those are called tics. This is something called akathisia, where you get this inner motor restlessness. So if you're sitting there and you just feel like you got to move. This can be associated with anxiety, uh, side effects of medication, and can be associated with dopamine as well. And the treatment for this depends on the cause. Dopamine. So we talked a little bit about dopamine. Um, when you talk about dopamine, there are different things that happen with dopamine. So we know Parkinson's is due to low dopamine, right? It's primarily a dopamine problem. Uh, high dopamine produces or promotes wakefulness, okay? High dopamine promotes wakefulness. With amphetamines, what they actually do is they actually increase dopamine levels, which keep you awake, right? Stimulant-type medications improve dopamine. Um, these are also seen, with, well, with Parkinson's disease, you get what? Low dopamine levels. So you think about that. High dopamine produces wakefulness. Low dopamine levels produce the opposite, right? So with Parkinson's, you have an in inherent tendency to be tired, sleepy, or otherwise. The challenging thing is now that we start to give dopamine medications, right, uh, these dopamine levels as they increase, you would think that they would keep you awake, but they actually have kind of uh, an opposite effect, and certain medications can cause you to be sleepy, right? So Ropinerol, Requip, uh, Nupro, uh, Mirapex, these are dopamine agonists, and one of the big side effects is sleep attacks. Doesn't happen very commonly, but this is one of the potential side effects that can occur. So when you get that, that can cause you to be sleepy. So just by having Parkinson's with low dopamine, you tend to be sleepy, and then the medications can cause you to be sleepy. Challenging, right? So trying to find that balance. Everybody has a different uh, uh, way or different method of uh, getting to that balance and trying to adjust our medications and our treatment plan, tailor it accordingly. Um, the dopamine medications, of course, also have strange side effects, the Requip Nupro, Mirapex are, tend to be those medications that are dopamine agonists that help. They're also associated with these impulse control disorders, which your doctor may ask you about. And uh, these are things like compulsive gambling. Okay. Uh, compulsive type behavior sometimes can occur where you collect match sticks for some reason. Mm -hmm. you know, so I've seen uh, things from uh, uh, a patient who came into my office and was on a medication. I was looking at it for the first time. He said, doctor, I just like to gamble. So, oh, what's been going on? So I have said, yeah, we just declared bankruptcy. How much did you spend? $200,000. Wow. Looking at his medication, I'm like, did anybody ever tell you about this medication causing impulse control disorders? And, you know, it hadn't been mentioned to him at some point. But until you think about it and are aware of it, it doesn't happen very commonly, but, uh, but sometimes it does happen. So people doing internet shopping, right? Playing games on the phone. Uh, very, very strange things can occur with certain medications. Uh, daytime sleepiness. So, tend to fall asleep at inappropriate times, such as a sleep talk. <laughs> no. so, so, that can occur. It's always challenging to keep people awake during a sleep talk. Uh, but that can occur. So, uh, is this due to drugs or is this due to the disease? Of course, it could be a combination of both, right? So, we talked about dopamine promoting wakefulness and also dopamine causing people to be sleepy. So we look at screening for sleep habits. Uh, you want to ask them about do you fall asleep watching TV, driving, car accidents, all these things, you know, 
uh, it becomes challenging because as you get older, you know, when you're younger, you have a lot of things going on. You're working, you have things to do. When you get older and you're retired, uh, not everybody, but some people, once you're retired, you don't do as much. Or because you're Parkinson's, you're limited with movement, so you tend not to do much other than maybe you sit, watch TV, and what do you do? You fall asleep, right? So these are things, so trying to get up and be active and do something else is actually something that's really important. Um, these dopamine agonists uh, can cause daytime sleepiness, of course, as we're trying to adjust the dose. And uh, we use things, we use hey, coffee sometimes. There are medications, we use Ritalin, sounds strange, but we use these stimulant medications, ProVigil, NuVigil. These are stimulant type medications that keep people awake, okay? Um, these sleep attacks we kind of talked about with the daytime sleepiness can occur in less than 5% of people. But it's definitely something if you have a sleep attack, if you're driving, of course these things are, are really important that you need to be aware. So uh, we talk about things like uh, good sleep hygiene, okay? So what does that mean? So getting rid of false beliefs. So trying to adjust your uh, sleep accordingly. Uh, avoid caffeine and nicotine before going to bed. Try not to use alcohol as a sleep aid. I kid about the gin and tonic, but of course, what does alcohol do? So when you drink alcohol, it changes how much or how much REM sleep you get into, right? So it pushes it back. So now what happens, you don't get those deeper stages of sleep because you're, even though you have good sleep onset, right, you've altered those levels. You've altered that elevator pattern. So you've pushed that REM sleep, that deeper stages of sleep back. So you wake up, people, I'm sure everybody's had a hangover at some point, and you wake up because you've had disrupted sleep throughout the night. You're not getting those deeper stages of sleep. And then what happens the next day? You need to sleep, right? You need this rebound sleep. So when you look at that, people who have been um, avoiding or pushing back their REM sleep, when they actually go to bed the next night, instead of going through those cycles, what happens? You go into this quick REM sleep. You kind of skip through all of those and get into those deeper stages faster because you're sleep deprived. That's actually what happens when people with narcolepsy, which is a strange thing, right? People falling asleep quickly. What happens is actually they're falling asleep, they go through those stages, but it may only take, instead of taking 90 minutes to get to REM sleep, they fall into REM sleep within 15 minutes. Okay? So they say, I'm going to take a nap. And then they're out. They go into REM sleep. And so, so this is something that's real that can occur. It happens. Narcolepsy is a very strange disorder, but can occur. You know, sometimes people, um, if they're laughing or somebody tells them a joke, it causes them to pass out and go into REM sleep. It's a very strange thing to see. But uh, this has to do with your sleep. And so, of course, avoiding these things that affect your, your sleep stage is important. Uh, we talked about avoid uh, evening diuretics. These are medications that help you urinate, right? You don't want to take that before you go to bed. It makes sense. No long naps. And a lot of people will have problems where they actually sleep during the day, and then they're up all night. And they say, okay, well, I have insomnia. Well, it's really insomnia is your sleep pattern, right? So... So we say to exercise early in the day, keeping your room kind of cold, dark, quiet, avoiding things um, in bed. Don't put a refrigerator in your room. Um, you know, I always tell patients your bed should be for sleep or sex only. That's it. Don't read. Don't watch TV. If you're not falling asleep in 30 minutes, get up, go do something else. Go sit on the couch. When you get tired, go to bed, right? Because it doesn't make sense to sit there in bed. Uh, it doesn't make sense to associate your bed with TV or reading or people who just like the TV on when they go to sleep, right? Even though it's, it's bright light, people with their phones and you know now you've got all these different things and, and technology. So white noise sometimes helps and then avoid the scary movies or avoid the news and things that are on. <laughs> so uh, you know, then you try not to take these things like over-the-counter medications. The reason for that is you may want to take something like you know, Tylenol PM. What does Tylenol PM have? It has Benadryl. Right? So Benadryl can cause a hangover sensation. It can cause problems. It's an antihistamine. It can cause problems with restless legs. It can cause problems with a variety of things. A lot of these things are good for short term, but then you become dependent on certain things in a sense that uh, you get a plateaued response after a while. So you take the medication or take these and it works, but you want to try to avoid this as much as you can. Of course, it becomes challenging over time, um, but that's something that you should try to do. Uh, all right. So this says, um, I probably shouldn't wake him. He needs the exercise, right? So this is somebody who's got sleep walking and, uh, you know, she's okay with it as long as you're not injuring yourself. So another strange thing that occurs during sleep doesn't happen very frequently, but, uh, and if you wake somebody up, they don't die. If people have heard that before, because that was something that came up before. 
Um, and I'm gonna stop there. <laughs>